Outside, a Montgomery police officer guarded the area. Inside, the $2.5 million worth of recovered coins, gold and silver, precious metals and jewelry lay sorted out on tables waiting to be reclaimed. Most of the dealers did not want their pictures taken for security measures. All praised police investigators for arresting the suspects 48 hours after the robbery and recovering most of the stolen valuables. Coin dealer Lloyd Gibbs of Birmingham reclaimed about thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars worth of property. Gibbs says he still plans to attend future coin shows, but only with city police protection. Uh, this is on the circuit, and we will not go unless they do have city police officers, no guards. Was it difficult for you to identify your goods? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It it, it would look like that uh, it would probably be pretty difficult for anybody to identify this, but I think if you talk to the uh, police department, they will tell you that we, we handled it efficient. Uh, we, we helped each other find each other's coins because we know each other's other's codes. We know, the, um, we know their packaging. We know um, the, the dealers who they come from. So uh, it was just real easy. In the meantime, police take their investigation to Houston and Dell counties in South Alabama and North Florida. Presently uh, getting a group of detectives uh, ready to go to Florida to recover some of the cases that were uh, disposed of in uh, a remote area in Florida. Uh, we hope to make more arrests in the case as uh, the case unwinds. Uh, right now we're really just getting into this case. Even though the property's back, fixed to go back home, we still have approximately a month to a month and a half of investigation to do. Alford says the suspects made several mistakes in the robbery. For starters, he says the robbery wasn't well planned. Alford says the suspects carried only one knife and one pistol and says the rental truck was easily traced. What remains now are several thousand dollars in cash still not recovered and at least three more people expected to be arrested in the largest robbery in the history of Alabama. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News at the Montgomery Civic Center. getting a group of detectives uh, ready to go to Florida. More arrests in the case as uh, the case unwinds. Uh, right now we're really just getting... have to protest the second year that the president is uh, trying to achieve unprecedented cutbacks in social services, in housing for poor people, and in education aids. Uh, we feel that the president had no mandate to cut back across the board. He did have a mandate to trim budgets and to try to uh, curtail inflation and to do some other things. But we don't feel that 27 percent of the registered voters of this country who voted for President Reagan represent a mandate to turn the back of this country on poor people and the working, average working people of the United States in the way.
After serving as chief deputy district attorney in Montgomery and four years as the U.S. attorney in the middle district of the state, Barry Teague wants to go from lawyer to lawmaker. Teague will get a chance to run following his nomination from the state Democratic Executive Committee members, a 78 to 23 vote which overturned the nomination made by the county Democratic Party. The county party endorsed Representative Larry Dixon by a one-vote margin. I feel that one of the things that helped the party leaders around this state make their decision to choose me as their nominee is the fact that some five years ago, uh, two of the greatest Democrats in this state, uh, the late Senator Jim Allen and uh, Senator John Sparkman, whose judgment is greatly respected by all Alabamians as well as the Democratic Party in this state, uh, decided that I was the man most qualified to be the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Alabama. And uh, I feel that when the Democrats looked at me and the, the judgment that, uh, and the faith that those two fine Democrats had in me, uh, I, just, I think that weighed heavily in my favor as getting the nod. Teague says he thinks he'll have a better degree of acceptance in the senatorial district, which swings from the predominantly black western section of the city to the southern residential areas. So far, Teague's only real platform is law and order, but he says he'll be walking the district doing some things he says he does well, listening. By April 6th, uh, I believe the people of Senate District 27 will know where Barry Teague stands, and Barry Teague will have a good idea how to best serve these people. There's just less than a month for those interested in this Senate seat to run for it. Other than Teague, only one person is qualified, Alabama Conservative Party candidate Gordon Tucker. The Republicans haven't nominated anyone yet, missing a 12 o'clock deadline set by the Secretary of State's office for today, although there is really no law setting that deadline. Even though he has no Republican opposition, Teague says he'll run as if he did. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Barry Teague had two major obstacles in reaching his goal of being the Democratic nominee. One was Representative Larry Dixon of Montgomery, the man the Montgomery County Democratic Party narrowly selected as their recommendation. But the state Democratic Executive Committee chose Teague instead on a 78 to 23 vote. The other obstacle was the Republican Party. But when noon rolled around today, the unofficial deadline to qualify, no one in the Republican Party had submitted qualifying papers. If you want my opinion, I would, uh, I would be inclined to think it's a compliment to me. Uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, they will have another shot come November to put up another person. And, uh, mm -hmm. of course, the voters will know more about Barry Teague and uh, uh, how he stands with respect to his Senate duties by that time. The only opposition Teague has is the Alabama Conservative Party candidate, Gordon Tucker. And Teague says although Tucker doesn't represent a major political party, he's going to take the campaign seriously. He says he'll be walking the 27th Senate District between now and the April 6th election, hoping to convince people that he is the best man for this seat in the Senate. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. The visitors from Brooklyn came into the NIT opener as the nation's highest scoring team with an average of over 87 points a game. But it was Illinois which lit up the scoreboard, setting a new single game tournament scoring record in a 126 to 78 route. Led by Perry Range's 21st half points, the Illini broke to a 65 29 lead at the intermission, reducing the final 20 minutes to garbage time. With sophomore guard Derek Harper leading the break, Illinois beat Long Island at its own game. Range gets the easy one here but he hit from the outside as well in leading all scorers with 28 points. Six other Illinois players scored in double figures with Jay Daniels pouring in 20 off the bench and Craig Tucker adding 16 from the outside. For LIU coach Paul Lizzo, the whole experience was a nightmare. His Blackbirds returned to Brooklyn with a final 20 and 10 record and a lesson that Big Ten teams can run the fast break too. Now in the second half,
the com you know the riding bulls and everything and our job is here to protect the fallen rider or the f rider that gets fucked off we go to him track the bull away from thing away from the deal you know it's a little act we got to be funny but also it's um, another job to take care of that too how do you set up your stuff with the guy who's working the mic do you know him is he do you work with him all the time well no uh, <clears throat> i know the man who's going to be working tonight you know mr clemix bad a terrific rodeo announcer i really like i worked with him several times you know i don't work with him all the time but uh, no, we don't. We really, Susan Clem and I, we don't even get together and say, here's what I'm going to do, 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 you know. Just ad lib. Huh? Just ad lib. I figured that. One time I did that and I found, fell on my face, you know, doing that sort of So I just went to ad lib and it worked out fine. Now, some people that would switch the acts and everything, they might put a little piece of paper up to show how the acts would go, but then it's between them and how he maybe just ad lib it with it until they act. You know, but How'd you get into this? I got into it 12 years ago accidentally. I was at um, Twin Falls, Idaho. And they need a barrel man. The barrel man hadn't showed up. He got hurt or something. And the producer at the rodeo saw me and said, Will you get in the barrel for the night? And that's how I got started. And I've been in ever since. Barbara Mozo of Enterprise is this year's Jefferson Award winner. Mrs. Mozo established an English class for Koreans and brought a Korean minister to Enterprise to translate church services in Korean. The Jefferson Award is a national honor sponsored by the American Institute for Public Service. Mrs. Mozo received the local award sponsored by WSFA-TV. A panel of five judges picked six finalists from 100 applicants. The other finalists are Bill Light of Montgomery, who has been a foster parent for over 50 children through the years. 86-year-old Henry Lisi, also of Montgomery, volunteers two days a week at the Central Alabama Rehab Center. Risa Bird of Enterprise gives programs to local schools on the dangers of smoking. Joe Reese Tisdale, the director of music in Yop City Schools, operates the local public access channel. And Gene Parr, an LPN from Dothan, conducts free high blood pressure screenings. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. Perhaps the most pleasant of all the, the duties, and especially recognized at this time, the first. Each of you to remain in the building following serves on this court as a supernumerary judge. Judge, we're delighted to have you 
We're especially proud and pleased to have Judge Gene Lowe, former presiding judge of Montgomery Recorder's Court, with us also. We draw Local Democrats already have an idea of what Mr. Reagan will talk about when he arrives in Montgomery this Monday. The president of the Young Democrats, Attorney Terry Davis, says President Reagan probably won't deviate from trying to drum up support for his new federalism polls, plan uh, and his 1983 uh, budget. May come up with Davis says the president changes, will probably put in a plug part, for the state Republican to. Party. President Davis, how do the Young Democrats view President Reagan's visit to Montgomery this coming Monday? We are, we are extremely cautious, but uh, I don't think we're, we're anxious because we, we don't expect him to say many things different from what he's already proposed. Um, uh, he may come up with a few minor changes, but for the most part, I think he's going to stick with his guns right now because he, the, the line, although it's been drawn to a certain extent, he still, he still has some time to try to get through many of the things that he wants to get through. Davis says his party remembers getting whipped by the Republicans in last November's election. Davis says the future of the new federalism plan and Reagan's 1983 budget, especially in the area of defense spending, will have an effect on the outcome of this year's election. Earlier this year, President Reagan introduced his new federalism plan to the people in the Midwest. That plan is expected to be the center of protest when the president visits Montgomery this Monday. Democratic leaders say they're hoping the president's plan will continue to receive the same type of reception this November that he's expected to get this Monday. Cool, but respectable. Kim Davis, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Same as many other Democrats and, and other people in the state and country look at it, uh, we, we're sort of anticipating him to say pretty much the same things that he's been saying in the past, and uh, we expect him to put a plug in. One reason that he is getting so much opposition, not only from Democrats, but from the individuals in his own party, is because they know that the American people will not accept what he is proposing. He is, uh, uh, particularly with the defense spending, uh, he is, is shown a lack of, of interest or a, uh, uh, an over-concern to be with the, uh, with the defense spending. And it is sort of, it seems that he is overlooking the actual and real needs of many of the American people. Mrs. Hawkins is a staff development specialist. Before her forced retirement, she'd been with the state for 14 years. After her retirement, she stayed on the job for several months on a voluntary basis. They just retired me. They just retired you? So you got to go? They just uh, issued a retirement paper. Paid me my, for my annual leave and sick leave and said go. But the um, uh, commissioner, who was Gary Cooper at that time, uh, accepted my suggestion that I volunteer. They were in such a state. Mrs. Hawkins' attorney, Julian McPhillips, so says this is a landmark decision which opens the gates for other state employees to remain on the job even though they're age 70 or older. Mrs. Hawkins says she filed the suit not because she needed the money so much, but because she wanted her job. She says she plans to go back to work as soon as possible and ask for back pay, which amounts to about $44,000. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. Mrs. Hawkins didn't want to leave her job with PNS, but when Governor James issued an order saying all state employees had to retire when they reached the age of 70, she was given her last paycheck and shown the front door. But Mrs. Hawkins didn't stop there. She challenged the order, and the state Supreme Court agreed with her. The prelude to Governor James's memorandum of August 9, 1979 stated as an economic measure. We're going to cut back here, there, and everywhere. And then paragraph 3 said uh, no employee beyond the age of 70 would be continued in state employment uh, unless the public health of Alabama were involved and then only with the approval of the finance director. So it was clearly a, a, a financial or economic measure on his part. I think the Supreme Court of Alabama, in ruling as they did, said that those kind of measures are legislative matters and can only been, be ruled on by the legislature. Alabama law requires state employees to retire at 70 unless the employee applies to the state personnel board for a year-by-year -year exemption and can prove physical and mental fitness. Mrs. Hawkins says she plans to get back to work soon and ask for back pay. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News.
I was disappointed, uh, Truett, at the length of the sentence. I thought it was a little severe. Or rather, I thought it was severe, not a little severe. Mr. Hope was a perfect candidate for probation. And I just feel that the, uh, the fact that a public official was involved and there was a lot of media coverage uh, could have affected the sentence. Probably preferred that it had been a longer term, to tell you the truth. But uh, I thought the judges had done a real good job throughout this trial, and I'm not going to uh, fall out with him now. I would like to see a longer sentence, but I, I know the judge did what he thought was fair and what it should be done under the circumstances, and, and I think it's a reasonable sentence. You can't ask anybody to do any more than what they think is right. <clears throat> and the court, like he said, took all those things in consideration in the sentence, and I, I thought it was a fair sentence. The AKAs are meeting in Montgomery for their regional conference, but took time out for a prayer vigil to ask for the freedom of Maggie Bozeman and Julia Wilder and the extension of the Voting Rights Act. Let us pause and listen to the winds of change. The winds blow strong and wild and gusty and dirty and black and frightening. And sometimes we begin to think about the possibility that there may be no tomorrow or no future. For it is times like these that we must consider the destiny of our black sisters. Yes, we are our black sisters' keeper, Mrs. Maggie Bozeman and Mrs. Julia Wilder. Sewell says they want to touch Governor Fob James Hart as well as the members of the state's pardons and parole board. She says they want human suffering ended with better education, housing, and other facilities for all people. A representative from the Southern Rural Women's Network says Bozeman and Wilder are political prisoners. The network is planning a summit on April 17th and 18th, starting in Pickens County. The group will trace the route of the 1982 voting rights march by car, then on to Tuskegee where they'll meet with the two women. Two representatives from Governor James' office were presented two petitions, one to the governor, the other to the Pardons and Parole Board. Mrs. Evelyn Lowry, wife of SCLC President Joseph Lowry, says SCLC lawyers are working with the Pardons and Parole Board in hopes of getting both women freed. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. The women say it's obvious that their presence was needed in Montgomery today because if there were justice, they wouldn't be on the Capitol steps. The AKAs are meeting in the capital city this week for their regional convention. They want the freedom of their sorority sister Maggie Bozeman and Julia Wilder and the extension of the Voting Rights Act. And so ours and people of this great state, we will not be free until our sisters, Sora Maggie Bozeman and Ms. Julia Wilder, are set free. And we will do all we can to fight. Will we please join us? Will you please join us in our effort to get these two ladies paroled so they can return to their homes and fight the litigation in the court? The women also want jobs and equal opportunity, as well as the end of human suffering, better housing, education, and other facilities for all people. A representative from the Southern Rural Women's Network says they'll have a summit in Pickens County on April 17th. The next day, the group will leave and trace the route of the 1982 voting rights march, then on to Tuskegee, where they'll meet with the two women. Two representatives from Governor Bob James' office were presented two petitions, one for the governor and the other for the Pardons and Parole Board. In the meantime, Southern Christian Leadership Conference lawyers are working with the state's Pardons and Parole Board in hopes of getting the two women freed. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. We shall encourage the tens of thousands. Today, we hear the faint echo of a new federalism. The message is yet unclear. A message that at this hour is gobbled by shrill voices of those who profit 
from the federal subsidy of corporate welfareism, such as a Chrysler Corporation, from those who profit from middle-class welfareism bestowed through the Federal Department of Education and other such agencies, from those who profit from billion-dollar social program after billion-dollar social program advertised to eliminate poverty while, in fact, increasing poverty, poverty of spirit, and poverty of flesh. ...in that fatal direction. We must change course. We must change course now. You and I must sacrifice and demand that Congress eliminate its deficits and reduce the national debt to manageable levels. In their obsessions to stay in public office, too many of those in power have tried to please all, to be all things to all people. As a result, the federal government has been living on borrowed money and on borrowed time. Okay, I'm going to pick up. This is coming from Troy, Michigan now. You. Okay. Also, the room, we have instructors that are transmitting their graphics to one location and the students on the reverse end are simply receiving it. Or you can have what we have right now, which is transmitting and receiving. We can interact. That basically comprises the major components. Ohio State looked strong in the opening period. Tony Campbell led the Buckeyes to a 29-22 halftime lead. James Madison's 2-3 zone shut down the Buckeyes in the second half, while Duke's center Dan Ruin pumped in eight of his 18 points in a stretch run that turned a 42-34 deficit into a seven-point victory. The final, James Madison 55, Ohio State 48. The Duke's next opponent will be North Carolina. In defeat, the Buckeyes closed their season with a record of 21-10. I spend about, oh, in training itself, about an hour a day, four days a week. And then when you count the dieting and the uh, posing practice and that sort of thing, it amounts to about three hours a day. So not only do you build your body, but you have to learn to present your body as well. And oh, yeah, that's, that's a major requirement to be successful at bodybuilding itself, is presentation. Okay, how do you prepare yourself now? You're, you're just two or three days away from this competition. Do you have a routine? Yeah, I'm still going through my workouts pretty hard, and now mostly I'll concentrate on uh, losing the water 
out of my skin to make the muscles show up better. I stayed on a very strict diet, probably less than a thousand calorie a day diet, and practicing my presentation again. It wasn't Sunday, but the parking lot at First Baptist Church in Enterprise was filling up the morning we visited. You might say that some of these people had come from around the world to be there. Some of them, their husbands are in the Army. Some of them are, um, are people who have immigrated here, and people who are refugees come. And we just have a different, each one of them is different. The group of nearly 40 students gathers each week for English class. The organizer is WSFA-TV's 1982 Jefferson Award winner, Mrs. Barbara Mozo of Enterprise. Met a Korean girl, a young Korean mother who just had a baby. And we started out looking for someone to translate for her. And the more we looked, the more we found people who did not speak English. We ended up with about 10 people who, who could not communicate and couldn't get a job and couldn't understand how to shop. So we started just doing survival things, you know, how to say my house is on fire, how to say my baby is sick, and just working this way. And then we started having some training uh, and, and just reaching out to the people. And the more we have, the more people we have. Class begins with introductions, so students will get used to speaking in groups. Then volunteer teachers guide them through their lessons. But Mrs. Mozo says what the students need most might not be found in books. Just coming to the States, when they first come, they say, usually they spend the first year crying. It's, it's a terrible thing to come to a new country and not understand the language, not understand the customs. The people don't eat the same. You're, you're homesick in the first place. And then you have all that to, to deal with. Mrs. Mozo and her group of volunteers is committed to making that transition a little less painful and find that despite the barriers of language and culture, people's basic dreams and desires are really very much the same. They want the, the same thing, you know, and they're, some of them are worried because their children may forget Korean or not be able to, to understand them at some point in time. How do you reach out? It's a matter of opening up and just reaching your hand out and putting your guard down and then being able to, to see your love and your care and your concern and you're reaching out to them and then they respond. A lot of times there's, the language is not there but it's the fact that you care about them and they know. And I can, I think, speak on behalf of some three million Alabamians uh, when I say uh, that this is not rhetoric, it's a reality, the fact of the matter is, the people can't afford any more increases. They can't afford what they have now. With 45% of their members out of work, union groups marched down Government Street to protest everything that brought them there the economy, the shutdown of plants like Alcoa, and the use of out-of-town labor on projects like the $38 million Riverview Plaza complex. As the marchers made a special pass by the construction site, it was business as usual for the workers, although some did stop to read the signs. The union claims most of these workers are not from Mobile. The North Carolina-based construction company denies that, saying 88% of them are. Project manager John Boyd says what's really at issue is the fact that most of the labor is non-union. There is not much work going on in Mobile as far as construction. And if you were sitting in, uh, if you had a bunch of people that needed jobs and you were the man getting them work, uh, I think you'd be upset also. I think that's where they're coming from. The group, 300 people strong, then rallied at Bienville Square. They cheered on anything that would help like the prevailing wage bill, a legislative act that would prevent companies from paying substandard wages, something they claim is needed at the Riverview Plaza. You saw a picture of the Radisson building up there. You saw a big headline that local contractors get $4 million worth of work. What the hell is $4 million out of $38 million when you're building it downtown in our community? Hey! The unions feel Mobile has forgotten them. They say the use of out-of-town labor forces local taxpayers to support their own unemployment.
Are you one of those people who just dread Monday mornings, can't get your act together, just can't seem to get your rhythm going, can't get motivated? Well, you know, some of the folks here at the Central Plaza Towers in Crichton used to feel the same way about Mondays. But that was before the Jolly Seniors Band put the rhythm back into Monday mornings. Now, you might think it would be a little startling to wake up to a band in your backyard, but I heard no complaints at the towers. The Jolly Seniors make Monday mornings special. Music for listening, music for dancing, music to crochet by. They bring residents to the balconies, they bring life to a party, and they can bring back some memories. Because their music has a faraway, dreamlike carousel quality. Music like your best recollections of a Nickelodeon and a washboard band. We played 21 engagements in 24 days. And that's going nearly every day. And someone says, aren't you afraid that the, these people are too old to be getting out like that? And I said, these people stay in better shape than you would ever believe. If they were sitting in their apartments or in their homes doing nothing, they would become stale. They're folks from your neighborhood and mine. Let me see if I can spot them out for you. Okay, there's band leader Nancy Bennett pounding that piano. And her husband, Ralph, he just fiddles around. There's another husband and wife team, Leroy Wyatt on the harps. He's 81. His wife Kathleen plays those sexy cymbals. And there's Maurice Mitchell on mandolin, Marietta Santangelo on the melodica, and Mary Edwards on the alto. Hey, careful with the claves, Emily. Lee Brown and Mary French are tearing up the snares. Mary Floyd plays a tantalizing tambourine, and have I left out anybody? Oh yeah, there's Mildred Lane, the youngster at age 60. She's the kid on the xylophone when she's not playing Dolly Parton. I'm a senior citizen, Dolly Parton, though, you I know. See. I'm her, give her, I'd say, maybe give her about 25 years, and she probably would be me. Or maybe, I tell you what, maybe not quite as good. <laughs> would you believe they put this band together in an old filling station on Spring Hill Avenue? That was 12 years ago. Now they're scheduled for big conventions. They meet dignitaries, they visit nursing homes, and they play at public dances and sing-alongs, like this Love Day celebration last month. What's this band all about? It's about having fun the second time around. People loving life in the long run. We really are the luckiest people in the world. Yeah, that's the Jolly Seniors Band. They can only leave you hoping that you too can be that jolly when you're that senior. There are those who criticize President Reagan and blame his administration for the economic downdrafts of today. They know better or either they are economic basket cases. The well was pumped dry over the last two decades by a federal government totally out of control, by reckless borrowing and spending sprees that weakened our dollar and threatened to destroy city, county, and state governments in making them totally dependent on the federal government. This is a landmark decision, not only because it will have the effect of reinstating Mrs. Hawkins back into her job, but it will open the gates to other employees in state government 70 years old or older saying that they now may be continued, as the legislature so stated in its legislation, from year to year if physical and mental fitness evidence is produced to the personnel department and the personnel department approves their application. It no longer means that only the public health uh, is the only area where you can be continued in employment, uh, and then with the approval of the finance director only, which is what Governor James' memorandum said.
Karen Sellers is director of the Montgomery Domestic Abuse Shelter. She says since the shelter opened in August of 1980, more than 300 battered wives and their children have come for refuge from family violence. The domestic abuse shelter is for people, victims in family violence situations. It could be a mother comes with her abused child uh, to get it away from an abusing father. It might be a woman who has been beaten up by her husband. The women, besides being given shelter, are also provided with legal counseling and receive assistance in seeking employment. Mrs. Sellers says the center is almost always full of women who have left their husbands. However, those women may soon be left with nowhere to go because federal funding for the shelter has been cut, and without some assistance, it may close its doors. Currently, the shelter is operating totally on donations, but Mrs. Sellers says those funds will be exhausted by the end of the month. In an effort to keep the abuse center open, the four-member staff has been working without pay. Mrs. Sellers says if the center does close, a lot of women will suffer. They'll probably stay in whatever the situation is, uh, no matter how bad it is. Uh, some of them will die. I would, um, some of them will be able to get help from family and friends, and maybe they can go to another state or, or another city and get shelter there. Uh, for the people in Montgomery, I, I don't know. You know, they'll just have to stay in it. Tomorrow night, we'll talk with two former battered wives concerning their experiences. What would you Dan Black, WSFA TV News. Uh, getting a uh, group of detectives uh, ready to go to As uh, the case unwinds, so right now we're really just getting into this case. Even though the property's back just to go back home, we still have approximately a month to a month and a half. If we're fortunate enough to get by that, and certainly that's the first thing in our mind to have to play a team like North Carolina in Raleigh, which where North Carolina doesn't have to get out of the state. Uh, if they get to the Final Four, they'll have played all their games in North Carolina. So I think we got as, as tough a draw down Alabama complaining about it as we could have got. had a chance to pull it out. Danny Young shot.
They know who he is. But anything I despise is a backstabber. I've got some of them. Because you open your mouth in this county, thank God, the people who respect me, they put it, tell me what's said. And I am ready to go to work. I used to go to work. I'm going to go to work. The department going to go to work. We're going to straighten this department up. We're going to walk tall in Houston County. Well, this is an annual trip that we make to Washington. Uh, this year, I think it has more importance maybe than any year that we've been there because of the economics on the farm. We will be visiting with our senators and congressmen and with representatives of the Department of Agriculture and trying to impress upon them the real problems that we experience in agriculture today. Security for the president's visit will be extremely tight. Only legislators, their wives, and members of the news media with credentials will be allowed inside the Capitol. The Secret Service has barred all state employees who normally work in the Capitol from entering the building until after President Reagan leaves. House Speaker Joe McCorkadale says the action has frustrated dedicated employees. He says many would have liked to wave to the president. Those inside the Capitol will be forced to remain in their seats for about an hour before the president's arrival. Outside, the spectators will be kept behind ropes that will be positioned two blocks from the Capitol. It's very doubtful that any spectators will get a glimpse of the president. A coalition of 24 groups, including the NAACP and the National Organization for Women, want to picket the Capitol during the president's speech. But the Montgomery City Council refused to give the group a parade permit until after the president's left town. So instead, the group will rally inside the Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church. Group spokesman Bill Edwards says they'll protest Reagan's retreat from the commitment to poor people and his plan for military buildup. When the president leaves the Capitol, he'll go to a Republican Party reception at the Civic Center. Invitations for the reception went out to 250 members of the Republican Roundtable. Their membership requires that they pay a minimum of $500 to the GOP. Spectators have been barred from the reception, and news media representatives are also not allowed. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. According to statistics, 25% of all married women have been beaten by their husbands at some time. This 27-year-old mother of two, whose identity we are concealing, says she was beaten at random for seven of her eight years of marriage before divorcing her husband. She came to the abuse shelter for help. I had relatives I could have stayed with, but he knew where all of them lived, and I was afraid for him to know where I was, and I had to stay hid out for like two months. So. You know, and during that two months, hiding with my relatives would have been impossible. And other than this place, I don't know where I would have gone. Besides being given a place to live, the young woman was aided in many other ways by this shelter. I received a lot of emotional support for the main thing and a lot of help on legal assistance. And so many things that I, I couldn't remember all of them, but it was, it was really great. This 35-year-old woman was married to her former husband for 13 years. She says she suffered both mentally and physically. I have a busted eardrum on my left side. I wear top dentures. 
I have a scar on my front on the front of my left leg. I have scratches and scars, which they have gone away right now. But uh, mentally, I still have these. I can see them. It's just like somebody starting all over again. Sometimes at night when I go to bed, I wake up screaming. And I take the pill and I put it in my mouth because I don't want my children to hear me. This woman's advice to other women who may be experiencing some kind of abuse is to get out of the marriage rather than stay and hope for the best. On her own now, after having divorced her husband a year ago, this woman is highly concerned about the likely closing of the abuse shelter. This shelter is the best thing that could happen to the city of Montgomery. I'm hoping with all of my heart that nothing happens where it'll have to be closed down. There are a lot of women here in Montgomery, black, white, whatever the color might be. They need some help. Dan Black, WSFA TV News. No, that's not the case. There are women who have one child, women who have... But we felt it was fair, it was, it was unfair, and it was wrong uh, for him to refuse to meet with us for a period of five minutes. And as a result, uh, I have asked the uh, black members of the legislature tomorrow that if President Riggins uh, attempt to sell us his philosophy on the reverse Robin Hood of taking from the poor and giving it to the rich to walk out on President uh, Riggins' speech. Uh, I intend to uh, walk out on his speech and I certainly hope that the other black members of the legislature will walk out on his speech also if he attempts to sell that kind of philosophy here in the state of Alabama. In the East Regional, St. John's came back from a 12-point deficit against Alabama and took the lead on plays like this. Chris Mullen scores here. But Ina Swatley brought the tide back, and eventually they took a one-point lead. Still, St. John's could have won with the last shot. Billy Goodwin got it off, but Alabama eventually covers the ball, and the tide won 69-68. Definitely a tough loss for St. John's. The first game in the East was wild. Northeastern trailed Villanova by two when Eric Jefferson tied it up and sent the game into overtime. That didn't decide the issue, and in the second overtime, Jefferson scores again at the buzzer with a tip to tie it. In the third overtime, Villanova leads by two, but this time Northeastern couldn't come back. Dwayne McLean steals, and Stuart Granger puts it away. Villanova won 76-72. In the Midwest, Boston College upset DePaul 82-75 as the Eagles flew away with the game in the second half. John Bagley was high with 26 points, and freshman Michael Adams, who averages four points a game, had 21. Number three, Virginia almost toppled, but Ralph Sampson was a hero with some clutch shooting. Trailing Tennessee 51-47, Sampson hits. Later, the 7-4 center tied the game with this shot, and Virginia went on to win at the free throw line, 54-51 in the Mideast. Gary Hahn, NBC News. I'm going to insist as a commissioner that we have minority subcontractors and that minorities be involved in the total process as it relates to the construction of this project. And all I asked today was that uh, they associate uh, the firm of Gracie and Langford uh, as a bond counsel on this project along with another law firm to work as bond counsel and this was turned down. Now we've had architects already working on the project, not a single black has been involved. You're talking about bond counsels, we've spent thousands of dollars on this project. No blacks have been involved up until this point.
Lehigh School Auditorium was filled close to capacity. Fire officials expected the crowd would be so large they'd have to turn people away. But in the end, the spectators easily fit into the 1600 capacity auditorium. When we tried to enter the auditorium with our camera, we were told that we couldn't. We have not banned the cameras. The Secret Service has requested that there be no interviews, and the company has requested that there be no uh, uh, press interviews, which includes cameras and uh, uh, direct interviews by the uh, media. But representatives from the Joffrey Two Dancers forbid cameras from coming inside the theater, despite an okay from the Secret Service. They say the use of a flash is dangerous to the performers. Joffrey Two Administrator Thomas Krell says 13 dancers performed with the ballet. I asked Krell to let us photograph a picture of Ron Reagan, but he became angry and said he doesn't believe in singling out the president's son. But he did say he'd bring pictures of some of the other performers. When the dancers finish in Montgomery, they'll go on to Jackson, Mississippi, where they'll perform tomorrow night. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News.